If you ask me who my God is, on whose name I call, if you ask me who my God is, He's the God of us all, Allah the Merciful. If you ask me what my book is that I hold in my hand, if you ask me what my book is, it's the Holy Quran, the Holy Quran. Hmm. Assalamu alaikum and peace, and welcome to this episode of Misconceptions. My name is Muhammad Hashim, and today in the studio we have Yusuf Estes. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. And we also have with us today in the studio our studio audience. Assalamu alaikum, studio audience. Wa alaikum, salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Inshallah, today we'll be talking about capital punishment. So it's a big topic. Inshallah, we have enough time to cover it all, inshallah. So, capital punishment, Sheikh. It's, it's a, a deadly topic. Very deadly. <laughs> Literally. It's a, a word actually in English when we talk about capital punishment because it means literally uh, removing the head <laughs> because this is the capital right there. Um, but to understand it in Islam, is there such a thing as killing someone? The first thing we want to do is get the balance. As we always do in our programs, we talk about al-mizan, which is the balance or scale. And what we find in Islam is telling us that you cannot kill somebody. But it's not the same as the commandment, the seventh commandment we find in the uh, sixth commandment we find in the book of Exodus in the Bible. It simply says, thou shalt not kill. But what we have is in the Quran that you cannot take the life of anyone that is sacred. Now, that leaves something open here. Why is that open? Because if someone has caused damage to the society or individuals to the extent that they're taking away other people's lives or worse, then that person may be eligible for, to be put to death. That is, that is true. And obviously, certain conditions. Not oh, well, huh. you, you can't even That's begin to enumerate these conditions on a short program like this. But I think what we should do now is open up the... Uh, our conversation to include some of our audience. I would like to ask, uh, does someone have a question that they'd like to bring up regarding this capital punishment issue? Sheikh, I have a question. Yes, please, go ahead. Uh, do Muslims cut off the hands of robbers? Do Muslims cut off the hands of robbers? Okay, well, that's not capital punishment, but certainly that's a very serious thing when you start talking about cutting people's bodies up. And a thief, Scary too. <laughs> a thief in the Arabic language is called harami. Harami. Because they've done something very haram, forbidden. And what is it they've done? They've taken away somebody's possessions. But it's not just about taking away a loaf of bread. If somebody's hungry, this is one of the things that I've heard used again and again. Wow, you know, in Muslim country, you just, if you're so hungry and you take a loaf of bread, they start chopping your body up. Uh, yeah. Come on. First of all, in Muslim countries, there's no such thing as starving to death anyway. That doesn't exist because if they've got even a loaf of bread you're eating, they're not going to let any guests go uh, hungry. They're not. Uh, I'll give you one example of this. There was a young lady who started working with the Peace Corps. She went to Africa, and while she was in Africa, she was going to these small villages where the people were starving. And every time she would enter a village and they'd find out she was there, the next thing she knew they were having a feast. And there would be uh, some chicken pieces, there would be, you know, some rice, tomato, cucumber, there would be things laid out all over. And then she goes to another village and see it again. And so she said to the chief of the tribe at one place, she said, I thought you guys are poor and you don't have any food. He said, it's true. She said, well, how come everywhere I go, I keep seeing all this food? They said, it's because you're our guest. And what we're doing is we're going through the village and taking every morsel of food there is and putting it out because our religion teaches us to take care of our guests. And she started crying and she started examining Islam, learned the Quran, and she accepted Islam. She went back to Colorado and began trying to teach people about true Islam. Now, the example that I just gave you is a true story. And it shows the true spirit of Islam how could you have thieves if you're willing to feed people even the last morsel you have?
Another thing in Islam is the saying of Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he tells us that what is the condition of the believer, that he must prefer the needs of others over his own needs. So again, if somebody said, I don't have a place to stay, stay in my place, I'll go sleep on the floor. I don't have any clothes. Take my clothes, I'll go wrap up in a blanket. So this is the spirit of Islam. So if you're living in a true Islamic state where people are practicing real Islam, then immediately you're going to have to see a whole different picture than what we're seeing in other places of the world today. One of the things we have to be careful of when we start talking about these forms of capital punishment, severe punishment, this is only when you have a Muslim judge called a hakim. The Muslim judge has to pass this punishment and he has to be very well versed in Islam, memorize the Quran, memorize the teachings of Muhammad, and he has to have a, a high status in the community or it's not going to happen. Another point is that you must have a true Islamic state. There must be the type of emir which is a leader called a khalifa. khalifa. Otherwise, we don't have the right to go out and do these things as vigilantes. That's a very big misnomer, again, on the part of those who would like to spread hatred about Islam. To say these things is totally out of touch with reality. No one can act as a vigilante and do these things in Islam. They can't do it. I guess it just sounds very barbaric chopping someone's hands off, but you know, what, what are, what's the criteria? If you... Well, let me put it like this. Let's take the other side of the coin. The other side of the coin is that I was addressing a gentleman in a hospital up in uh, England. And while I was there talking with him, he was not Muslim, but I was visiting with him. He'd asked me to come and talk. I, I knew he was from Australia. All his relatives in Australia, no relatives in England. And he was always talking about Australia. And I said to him, if you could go anywhere in the world right now, where would you like to go? And I was sure he was going to say Australia. I was positive. Yeah. Uh, Melbourne, as a matter of fact, you okay. may be familiar with Melbourne. Very familiar. <laughs> <laughs> but he's from there. Anyhow, <laughs> so he said Saudi Arabia. Oh. <laughs> he shocked me. I said, Saudi Arabia? He said, yes, I was a truck driver for years in Europe and different places. He said, and when I would go to Saudi Arabia... I always felt the most secure ever in my life. I said, why? He said, because I could park my truck, leave the keys in it, and walk away and know when I came it would be exactly where I left it because nobody there would dare to steal. I said, why? He said, because they realize the punishment is so severe, nobody wants to get caught doing something like that. Now imagine, in the United States, you don't even, even that you put your keys in your pocket, and put an alarm in your car. And I've had people tell me, I just went into the bank long enough to just do such and such. So I come out, my car was gone. The alarm is gone with it. They're just stealing cars right and left. Now, if somebody steals, let's look at the other side of the damage that is happening in community by not stopping thieves. Okay. If somebody is stealing for a living, a thief, the one that cleans out your house, the one that robs you of all your hard-earned work that you put in your life into. He doesn't want to work. That's the point behind the hand, isn't it? He's not using his hand to work. He's using his hand to take from other people as a living. And he's stealing your very livelihood itself, stealing your truck, for instance, if you're a truck driver, stealing your tools if you're a, a carpenter or a workman. Stealing from you, uh, even stealing secrets and things, uh, espionage within a company. This kind of stealing is serious because it damages. It damages people financially, emotionally. It takes away the security and it replaces it with fear. A raw fear, like at night. If you walk in New York at night, you have to be careful. You don't know who might do something to you. Many people have told me about being robbed at gunpoint, at knife point having somebody overtake them and rob them. This is so common. If you went to the police department and said, somebody robbed me in Central Park. Really? Okay, What's what else? Yeah. What else is new? It happens all the time. Yeah, it so. happens all the time. What do you want us to do about it? Yeah. I'm sorry. How much did they take? Well, they took my watch. What was it worth? Five bucks. Five bucks? So? Did they get any money? I didn't have any. And you came all the way over to tell us about a five dollar watch? Get out of here. <laughs> They will do that because it doesn't have the same meaning to you and I. Anybody threatening your life or threreatening you no in property, any way, yeah. taking something away from you, it hurts. Whereas what 
Am I supposed to live in a society like that? How? In the society where you have this, do you know how often people have their hands cut off? How often? Almost never. Really? Almost never. Oh, goodness. On the other hand, in our society, right now in the United States of America, in the last 20 years, we've doubled the capacity for inmates in prisons from 1 million to 2 million. From 1 million to 2, two million. million. And every one of those is costing us as taxpayers an average of $45,000 per year. Oh my goodness. The billions of dollars for the penal institutions is even reflected on the graph, the pie graph that they give us on our income tax statement when we get it. Yeah. That is how serious it is. Now, imagine if you have serious punishment, who suffers? The one that loses the hand, but at the same time, how about all of us having to pay $45,000 a year for every single one of those people that are incarcerated? And by the way, maybe they chopped off his hand. He can still work, though, can't he, with the other hand, right? And he's not locked Unless up, because you lock him up. <laughs> the, the other problem you have is his wife, his children, and uh, whoever depended on him, his mother, they, they're now on social welfare. Who's going to take care of them? A very good point, isn't it? Ah, so this is really a big solution. And as we said, it solves the problem because nobody wants to steal anything. The only people afraid of that are who? Thieves. Thief. So when we hear politicians saying, oh, that's a barbaric. <laughs> oh, really? How much money did you steal today? Makes a lot of sense to me. We're running out of, uh, out of time. A bit. We're going to have to go to a quick break, inshallah. When we, when we do return, we're going to talk about the misconceptions and capital punishment, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> Closing the Gap Why Closing the Gap? In this program, Sheikh Yusuf Estes and Omar Dunlap are going to discuss how to bridge the gap between peoples of different cultures and orientations. The gap between males and females, Muslims and non-Muslims, the East and the West. Human beings feel like that they're being slighted one way or the other. The gap between the youth and the elders, the gap between various uh, status in working, the work field, and uh, education, and then trying to provide solutions for these particular problems. Assalamualaikum and peace and welcome back to Misconceptions. You're watching Misconceptions and today's misconception is capital punishment. So how can we keep going with capital punishment? What else are we talking about? Well, I about? think what we should do now is talk about the actual type of punishments which do include death okay. when somebody's going to be put to death. Now, in our country, in America, there are some states that have instituted the death penalty. Others have forbidden it. Okay. Now, at one time, the death penalty was all throughout our country, everywhere. But then certain states will change, and then for a while they'll have a referendum, and then they'll say no more death penalty, and then the new governor comes in, they'll change it and go the other way. But these death penalties that they're talking about are long and drawn out. Somebody could be in prison for 12 years waiting for that. Before they, and never before know they from one meal to the next if he was going to be walking down that lonely walk. The one-way walk. He doesn't know. Every day, every day, it could be the day. And this can have a very, very negative effect on a lot of people, including his family at home who are going through this same thing again and it's again, day after day. Is this the day my son is going to be executed? Is this the day my husband is going to be executed? So it's, um, you want to talk about barbaric. It, it, I can understand why people would think it's barbaric, because of the torture that so many people go through. But let's find out something about what Islam really says about that and then compare it to other cultures and other countries. 
Inshallah. Mm -hmm. our, our brothers, uh, anybody have a question I ready have to go? I have a question, sir. Yes, brother. Does Islam order us to kill apostates? Does Islam order us? It gives us the right to kill apostates. Hmm. Okay. The word in Arabic for this is murtid. 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 Someone who has gone out of Islam. Okay. And this is something that's really been exaggerated. Unbelievable. The way that this has been presented. I recall when I first was considering Islam or thinking about it, talking about it with my friend, Muhammad Abdurrahman, someone told me, stay away from that religion because if you get in, they'll kill you if you try to get out. And when I asked him about it, I didn't understand his answer. He said, no. He said, we would talk with them and help them to understand what Islam really is. I said, well, what if they still didn't want to do it? He said, well, then I guess we'd kill him. I went, whoa, hold on. Let me see what this is all about. So I had to do a lot of searching and soul searching before I got into Islam because of that. What I came to find out is that it is not what it seems on the surface. This is really in the case where somebody is being very verbal about being out of Islam and saying, hey, I went into it. It's no good. Come on, guys, get out of there. You know, let's get out of Islam. Because the effect of, that it has on the community of taking other people away from the truth. Because if you really believe in Islam, you believe it to be the truth. And it's all-encompassing. It's completely holistic. So all of a sudden, you've got somebody taking people away from the truth. And as we've mentioned in many programs, the first and foremost right of all is Allah's right to be worshipped alone right. without partners. Now, even if some people didn't follow all of Islam, but at least they say, yes, I know Islam is true, it's just I don't want to do all the stuff, then there's no problem. There's no problem. There's a problem for them on the day of judgment, no doubt, but they're not an apostate. They're not mortid. The mortid is the one who is going out and saying, I'm out of Islam, I don't want Islam, get away from Islam, and it does two things. One, it tears down the community around him, it puts doubts in people's minds and it starts a lot of fights. Uh, families go crazy over this kind of thing. And I've seen it happen when people want to make trouble. Personally, uh, have observed what happens and the whole communities go upside down. It's really bad. And even one man told me one time to talk to his son. Now, his son became a Christian. And he asked, the father asked me later, he said, do I need to kill my son? I said, absolutely not. He said, well, I thought we did. I said, no, because we found out that the son was quietly minding his own business, not causing any problem. And when he was at home, he wasn't doing anything unusual, wasn't worshiping a cross or doing anything strange. But when he would go to worship, he wanted to go to a church and he wanted to pray to Jesus. And I told him, although we don't pray to Jesus, we pray to the God Jesus prayed to. I talked to the son in quite a long conversation and I came to find out the real reason he wanted to be a Christian is so that the girl he was going steady with would marry him. That's what it was really about. But beside the point that whatever somebody's reason is, as long as they're not trying to break down the Islamic community, then we don't have that same attitude toward them. But okay. definitely if somebody's out here saying, you know, get out of Islam, I got out, come on guys, let's go. No, they've opened themselves up to a big problem. But remember this, what we said before. This is only in a case where you have a true Islamic state. Yeah. And you have a hakim, a real judge who knows and understands all the ramifications, memorized Quran, etc., etc. I'm going to ask you just a simple, uh, a simple question. A woman who marries a non-Muslim, does she become an apostate? Absolutely not. That's a sin on her, okay. but absolutely not apostate. Apostate is, from what our definition, is one who is loudly saying, I don't believe Islam, I don't want Islam, and I want other people to get out too. Now, if a person is not a Muslim saying all of that, we say, get out of our community, but we're not killing them. Okay? You've got you to gotta put everything in balance, that, and it is about the balance. Let's see if we have another question. Yes, Sheikh, I've got a question. It's, it's about adultery. Okay. Why do Muslims kill them? Kill the adulterers. Do we kill adulterers? Do we kill people that commit adultery? Actually, this is something we find in the Old Testament of the Bible about stoning to death. Yes. The adulterers 
uh, stoning to get death even fornicators, stoning to death uh, a lot of people. And so much so that in the New Testament, we find them saying that Jesus is telling the peace be upon him, yes. telling people not to stone a lady unless they have no sins. Because they were about to stone a prostitute. This lady was selling her body. So he, they were going to stone her. And he said, let the one... Cast the first stone if he... Yeah, has whoever no doesn't sin. have any sins, yeah. Mm. So what about Islam? What does Islam say about it? Well, originally, and we have it in the Quran, clearly if, uh, if this is the case, that the woman is to be put away. To, to keep her aside and uh, obviously keep her out of circulation because this is a very bad thing. But Islam is constantly open to repentance. We want to go back now and look at some of the others that we talked about. We talked about the one who steals, the one who fornicates. Now, adultery is when you're married, okay? But even in adultery, if anybody is committing any of these sins, if they're sincerely repenting to Allah, then the punishment's off. They're sincerely repenting, and it's not being put out in the open, and then they can be forgiven. So the punishment, now, the, punishment. the exception is going to be in the case of the one who steals, because he's damaged the community. Okay. But even he could make some arrangement to pay back what he's taken, and never and swear never to do it again. It could be up to the judge to say, okay, we're not going to do that. You follow? So if the judge determines the person's sincere in their repentance, he doesn't have to give this heaviest sentence. But it's there to keep people in check because they think, oh, <laughs> I don't want that to happen to me. Now, in the difference between adultery and fornication, the fornicator is an unmarried person who engages in sex outside of marriage. But an adulterer is the one who engages, and they are married, but they're doing this with somebody out here that they're not supposed to be doing that with. Now, how do we understand that? Well, what we understand quickly is the damage that it does to the marriage itself. And any time you ask a woman, and I've seen many, many women who have been wronged by their husbands. It's had, over the years, it's not once or twice. Within my own family, I've heard some from my relatives say the same thing, that they found for sure that this, the other spouse did so-and-so. I asked them, what was your first reaction? said, I want to kill them. Again and again, that's the response. Come, I want to kill them. I wish I could kill them. Mm, all that anger. Uh, and, this, and this could be weeks later, even months later, even a year later. How do you feel? I want to kill them. I wish I could kill them for what they did. Because they broke the trust we have. They've done something really evil. There's foul. It's bad. You know, I feel violated. I feel insecure. So from the other person, when you're married, you, this is a partnership. And a partner feels like you have done something horrible here. Now let's carry it to another level. If a child is conceived out of this illicit affair, as they call it, then where's the rights for this child? Mm. And why would this man, who's married to this lady, have to support somebody else's child? That's not fair to him. No. And why would the other man be deprived of his child? And then, on the other hand, how about inheritance? The child would not be inheriting from the real father. So there's a lot of problems that come out of that. So yes, there is this thing in Islam saying that adultery is so serious. Now... You still need four eyewitnesses. Oh, okay. I was going to ask you about that. Oh, yeah. You, you have four. to have four eyewitnesses to a penetration. All have to see it. All have to verify that they know that. And now, what kind of a woman or man would be willing to do something like this in public to the extent that four people could walk by and go, hey, what's up over here, you know, and see? And that means if there's a sheet over them or a cover over them, this doesn't count. Okay. And, and there have been a hundred people testifying. It won't work. But if a man accuses his wife, he knows she did it. He, she, and he's sure she did it. And he accuses her and swears. Then she in turn says, I swear I didn't. Then he swears, no, I say you did. I swear you didn't. And she comes back again, I swear, no, I didn't. And after the third swearing, if she still swears, then there's nothing you can do about it. That's it. But if she's lying, then she's going to have to deal with the law because she swears and asks for Allah's curse on her. If she's lying. The same for the man. If he says, I swear and Allah's curse be on me, then if it turns out he really did, and Allah knows, of he's going to pay. And hell is not a good place to go. 
None of us want to be there. But in the case of the one, again, Allah said in the Quran, the one who repents, Allah is most merciful, most forgiving to the one who sincerely repents to him. And that's a part of repentance is to stop doing it. This is a big key to the whole thing. Through all of our programs of misconceptions, we keep coming back to this one thing. There's a balance. There are rights and limits. And it's always up to Allah. And Allah is always tipping the scale in favor of the believer, in favor of the one who's sincere in their repentance. May Allah make all of us sincere in our repentance. Jazakallah kullu khair, Sheikh. Um, could you give us just a quick sum up of capital punishment before we do go? The idea behind capital punishment in Islam is to prevent. It is to keep us away from doing the things that are going to get us in trouble with the law. And it is the thing that keeps a society in a balance. And it is not something there as a gross uh, misuse of power to torture and hurt other people at all. It is there really to make life better for all of us. On that note, we've run out of time once again. Thank you for watching Misconceptions once again. I hope we've cleared some of the misconceptions about capital punishment. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. If you ask me who my prophet is, I will say, haven't you heard? His name is Muhammad. A mercy to the world. A mercy to the world. If you ask me who my enemy is, I will say, don't you know? If you ask me who my enemy is, he's that same old devil, that same old devil.